Good morning, Ohio. Welcome to this dream house with James Lewis. Today, our guest is Devin Still, a uh, former professional uh, NFL player and now author of Still in the Game Finding the Faith to Tackle Life's Biggest Challenges. Devin, how are you and Leah doing? I'm doing good. And Leah's doing amazing. She's almost four years in remission, so we're just blessed. That is awesome to hear. So what inspired you to write the book? You know, honestly, I was just coming off of a major surgery because I got hurt when I was with the Texans. And, you know, I was going in and out from all the pain medicine I was on. And my mom came down to Houston to take care of me. And when I woke up on the couch one morning, I saw that she was watching Oprah. She was watching her own network, and Oprah was interviewing Jack Canfield about Super so uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And he was talking about how he wrote these short stories to really inspire people to overcome their struggles. And in that moment, I felt like I was given an assignment to write about my story and give my testimony because there were certain people out there that were really struggling right now in the game of life, and they needed to find a playbook to get them off the sideline. So I decided to write this book. I agree with you. After reading this book, it, it's very inspirational. It uh, kind of uh, can show people that there is always light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Yep, exactly. That's the whole point. I, I wanted this book to really show people through the struggles that I talk about in this book, not only just with my daughter's battle with cancer, but the six different surgeries I had on the road to the NFL, the environment that I grew up in. I wanted to show people that no loss is ever too great to stop their comeback. So nowadays, with uh, how crazy things are, why is it more important now than ever before to slow down life and spend time with family? Because tomorrow's not guaranteed. And, you know, I realized that even more when the doctors told me my daughter had a 50% chance of dying. And only then did I make sure that I... I really took in every second, every minute, every moment that I have with my daughter because I didn't know when that would be going. So people shouldn't wait until, you know, their loved one is diagnosed with a, a disease like that or a terminally ill disease to really find out how precious time is. The time is right now to really just enjoy the time you have with your family and even to leave your legacy or your impact on the world because none of us know how long we have here. Exactly. Um, is there a room that you all tend to gravitate to to spend uh, family time in? Oh. Is there a room that you all tend to gravitate to to spend family time in? No, anywhere. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't have to be in the house. Um, anywhere. Honestly, we like just to enjoy time outside the house um, with nature, just to take a, a breath of fresh air because we spent so many years in the hospital sitting in the room every day that we just like to be outside the house. I know what you mean. Getting outside, being able to, uh, you know, spend time with family is so important. I was going to say, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I can relate. Uh, my son has Eagle Barrett syndrome, so I've also spent a lot of time over at Children's mm -hmm. Hospital in Cincinnati. Tell us about their great staff over there. Well, actually, I didn't spend time at Cincinnati Children's. My daughter was cheated at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Oh. Okay. Um, I can imagine being a defensive lineman, rest and recovery is a very important part of uh, what, you know, uh, what goes into the job. What type of bed do you have? I have a, uh, I don't know, I think this is like a, one of those Tempur-Pedic iCloud beds. I'm not sure. It was one of the first beds I bought, um, getting into the NFL because I knew how important it was to take care of your body. But like you were reading the book, making that transition from that type of bed to sleeping on a hospital cot is it's totally different, especially come off of a back surgery. It created a lot of problems with me playing football, but I felt like the sacrifice was worth it just to have my daughter be able to roll over in a hospital bed and see her dad laying by her bedside. Exactly. Having, her, having uh, her know that you're there to support her is always important. Uh, what was your childhood like? My childhood was rough. When my parents got divorced when I was in third grade, it really shook my world up like you were here in the book. Um, it, it 
made me spiral out of control. I started to get into a lot of trouble. But when I was introduced to football and when my dad, you know, set up for me to get arrested by the police, it really changed the trajectory of my life and put me on a better path because I understood what life was all about. When did you know that you had a future in pro sports? Was it high school? It probably wasn't until... For pro sports, obviously I knew I had an opportunity to play in the college uh, football ranks around my junior year of high school when I started getting a lot of scholarships. But even when I got to Penn State and I had uh, the two back-to-back season and injuries my freshman and sophomore year, I felt like my dreams of playing in the NFL was out of reach. And I didn't really gain back hold of that dream until going into my senior year when I had a breakout game against Florida. So it was a lot of trials and tribulations that I had to go through along that journey until I felt like my dream was obtainable. So what was the recruitment process like for you? It was crazy. It was, it was absolutely crazy. We was traveling all over the country to different schools because um, I speak about it in the book. My dad was a really good basketball player, but he never knew his dad, although he lived right down the street from him. So he made a lot of wrong decisions when it came to uh, what school to go to for college. So my dad wanted to make sure I didn't make that same mistake. So we were traveling all the time, even when it, we weren't on our official visits, because my dad wanted me to make the best choice that I could possibly make for my career. And when Joe Paterno actually came to Delaware to my high school, it was like a game changer because Joe doesn't really travel anywhere to see any kids. And for him to come to Delaware, it, it was just amazing. So is that what inspired you to choose Penn State? It was a lot of things that inspired me to choose Penn State. Um, one, of course, was to the, the play under legendary Joe Paterno and have him come to my high school like that. Uh, number two was I loved the defensive line coach, Larry Johnson. I really felt like he cared about me as a football player, but also as a young man, and he was going to teach me the lessons I needed in order to grow both on the football field and off the football field. And last, it was the close proximity to Delaware. When I was growing up, even though my parents was divorced, every time I was playing in a game, I could look in the stands and see both of them sitting together, cheering us on and supporting us. And I wanted them to be able to do that while I was in college. So I made the decision to go to Penn State. So do you have a, a man cave or a trophy room with all your awards that you've won over the years? I do. I do, actually, but the the award that probably means the most to me is the SB Award um, that me and my daughter won, the Jimmy V for Perseverance, just because that was one of the biggest struggles we ever faced in life, and there was times where we didn't know if we were going to make it through, and the way that we were able to stick together as a team and really continue to fight and use her battle with cancer to help other families out, it was a true testament to our faith in the power of God in my eyes. I agree with you. I mean, just being able to, unfortunately, had to go through all that, but you were able to inspire so many other people and able to raise so much money for that great cause that, uh, you know, shoot, I know at the time it didn't feel like it was worth it, but in, probably in hindsight, I would say, you know, your ability to give back uh, and, and help God's vision probably, you know, made it feel worth it. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us about your time with the Bengals. Yeah, so I got drafted to the Bengals in 2012. And to be honest with you, when you, when you read the book, you see how much struggle I went through in order to get it to get to that point. But I felt like I never really got to enjoy my time with the Bengals because I was battling so many injuries. And then when I felt like I was finally over the injuries, I found out my daughter had cancer. But the short time that I was with the Bengals, the support that they gave me during that time, it means the world now forever be grateful to the Bengals and have a connection with not only the team, but the city, the way that they were able to rally around us and really be there for us when it was times where I felt like giving up. Right? And every time I made a small tackle in the game, the stadium would just go crazy. And it really helped me out a lot during that time because I knew that I wasn't in Cincinnati alone, although I felt like that a lot of the time. 
So tell us a little bit about your uh, time with Coach Lewis. How, uh, yeah, you, like you mentioned, it was brief, but uh, you know, were were you able to? Did you interact interact a lot with him? And uh, what's your thoughts on the changing of the guard with them getting a new head coach? Yes, I saw the news um, a couple, maybe about a week ago, about them letting go of Marvin Lewis. And I know the type of guy he is, the type of coach he is, that he's going to bounce back on his feet. Um, me and Marvin had a, a good relationship. Like I said, he was there for me. He understood what I was going through, and he allowed me to put my daughter first before football. And I, I really appreciate that as a father because it was hard for me being out in Cincinnati because the only place I wanted to be was in Philadelphia with my daughter, but I understood I needed the insurance in order to pay for her treatment. And Marvin provided me every opportunity to do both. And then I can imagine uh, the Brown family, they were uh, very helpful as well. They were able to, you know, like you said, they were very supportive with the situation with your uh, jersey sales that ended up, uh, you know, helping out uh, the cause so much. I believe in that organization comes top down. So um, for them to to put my jerseys on sales for that weekend, not only raise awareness for pediatric cancer, but raise funds to uh, have money for research was very important. You mentioned that uh, the SB award is one of your biggest, uh, you know, awards that you know you really appreciate. Uh, tell us about that night. What was that like? And that was tough. Um, it was really tough because, number one, I wanted my daughter to be out there with me. Um, but she couldn't because she just went through a stem cell transplant. She wasn't a allowed to be around other people. But I just decided to go on stage and not write a speech, but just speak from the heart because I wanted people to understand what it was like, not only for me to go to this battle, but my family, my daughter, and uh, other kids that are in the hospital that were fighting then and that are fighting right now. So when you sit down to dinner as a family, who does the cooking? Oh, we, we all do cooking. Yeah, my wife, she makes us all chip dinner, so we all have different dishes that we prepare for dinner. Nice. Are you a gas or an electric family? Yes. Yes, yeah, I was going to say, I agree with you, that's the best way. I mean, it definitely does a much better job. So what's uh, Leah like to uh -huh. eat? So what's Leah like to eat? Anything. anything. Oh, nice. <laughs> Leah likes to eat anything. She's a grown little girl, so anything you put in front of her, she's going to eat. That is awesome to hear. I was going to say, my guy is so nitpicky, it drives you crazy sometimes. Really? Yeah, I mean, shoot, he has like three things he likes to eat, and it's just, you know, you try to get him to try other things. Like, he loves fruit, but that's about it. What what, uh, what type of kitchen do y'all have? What do you mean by that? Like a big kitchen or galley kitchen, uh, uh, you know, what type of, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a big kitchen. I'm not too familiar with the different types of kitchen because I, I don't spend a lot of time in there. But, uh, yeah, it's a nice kitchen. Excellent. And uh, tell us about your current projects and organizations that you're working with. Obviously, you've been working on the book a lot, but I know you like to give back to the community. You like to do uh, uh, your speeches and, and travel around and help out. Uh, what, mm -hmm. type of, uh, what type of things have you been getting into? Yes, yeah, so I've been really busy. Um, like you said, just finishing up this book and making sure that it gets out to people because I know there's a lot of people going through struggles right now that need this playbook. Um, I also run my podcast called Undefeated where I share stories of people who face life's biggest challenges and found a way to overcome. So people can really be inspired by their stories like everybody was by my family's story. And like you said, I do a lot of traveling around the country, uh, speaking to businesses and organizations, teaching them how to build a championship culture and mindset, teach them the playbook in this book in order to perform or make their comeback in the game of life. And then I also run our foundation called the Still Strong Foundation, where we financially assist families with the household bills so we can keep families in the hospital fighting this disease together. 
Excellent. So where are the best places to buy your book? People can visit stillinthegamebook.com. They can go straight to Amazon, or they can visit my other website, evanstillinthegame.com. Are there any people that you want to thank for their uh, help with the book? Yeah, I want to thank my co-author, Mark Dagnasto, um, Harper College Publishing, for you know seeing the vision in this book and taking it on to my family members, to the city of Cincinnati, the Bengals, everybody in this book that really played a part because I believe it was a team effort to put this story together, the people who made an impact in my life. Excellent. And then uh, before I let you go, any social media or websites that you want to uh, tell us about that fans can learn more about you and more about the book with? Yeah, definitely. Um, people can vi- follow me on Instagram at Still in the Game, on Twitter at Dev underscore Still 71. And I know a lot of people is, are interested in my family, um, my family dynamics, and Leah actually talked me into. Uh, starting a family YouTube, so we've been doing that quite a bit, and Leah just got her first love letter in the third grade, which is it's pretty interesting, uh, but I'm, I'm just glad to be able to experience those type of things, where, because there was a point where I didn't know if I was going to be able to have those moments, so they can follow us on there, we put up a lot of uh, family videos. Excellent. I'd like to thank our guest today, Devin Still, author of Still in the Game, Finding Faith to Tackle Life's Biggest Challenges. Thank you, Devin, for joining us. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. About the game that will keep you playing just to see how Pokemon.